that household tasks are a really exciting area for robots, <coughs> and um, there's uh, you know it's very challenging as we as we talked about. So some of the things you know like an, an automated fast food, automated McDonald's, like that actually seems like a pretty good idea. Like like a lot of it is very repetitive and sort of factory kind of uh, setting, and it and it seems like you could do it. Um, you might even have like a McDonald's vending machine that just like you know gives you a hot Big Mac. You put in your your your, do your dollar or something like that, and it, and it swipes back out. So I th I thought this was a pretty interesting one. Um, let's see. This is another one I really like. This, this is interesting because it's actually one, so so who's heard of the Predator drone? And everybody talking about drone strikes. Some of you guys. I'm actually surprised more of you haven't heard of it. So so we the United States have automated air, aerial airplanes, um, one of which is called the Predator, and it's basically an airplane with no pilot. It's teleoperated, so people fly it like you're sitting in Kansas or something. And, really, and I think this place where they fly from is often in the Midwest. And you're flying this airplane in Afghanistan or Iraq or something, and it's actually firing weapons. So when people are in the news, they're talking about drone strikes and we've you know, killed innocent civilians and everybody's angry at us or we killed this bad terrorist and maybe we're happy with ourselves, maybe we're not. Um, the technology that we're using to, to carry out these assassinations is, is airplanes with guns that are basically robots. They're being teleoperated, but they're flying uh, automatically. So, so a lot of this technology exists. Um, so this is sort of talking about emergency situations. Um, but uh, it's, another, it's an area where it's kind of happened. And then I think somebody else posted about like robots going to war for us, robots fighting for us to sit, you know, so we don't have to put soldiers in the field um, and, and, and putting uh, our own people in danger. And that, when you say it that way, it sounds very patriotic, but it's actually kind of scary. Like, like this is like a machine that somebody programmed, you know? Like, who's ever had an infinite loop in their program and it starts spewing, printing out? Yeah, yeah, it just goes forever and it like loads up all the memory and explodes. Like, this is a robot with a gun. Like, what are you? <laughs> 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 like, what, <laughs> what's supposed to happen when, when these things go wrong? And, and also, it's really, Interesting to think about how this is going to change warfare. Really fun, and it is, it is in our lifetime changing warfare very fundamentally. So, like, the idea that we would send, you know, put a gun on an airplane and assassinate somebody in a foreign country without putting any of our soldiers on the ground, without reading them their right. I mean, I know they're not citizens, but like reading them their rights and making really sure that only they are there in the room and, and stuff. Like, that's a decision that we as a country have made many times, and it sometimes doesn't work out. And the ethical implications of that are, are pretty murky. And, and so uh, I was actually, when I was um, just entering robotics, there was an ethics panel about military robots, robots with guns. And, and some of the researchers in, in the robotics community feel so strongly that this is a terrible idea, that we should never give any of our robots guns, that they simply won't take any funding from the military um, to do their research as a, as a sort of a way to protest. Um, and that is a pretty major decision to make as a researcher because there's a lot of money <laughs> um, from the Army and the Navy and, and, the, and the Air Force. And, and I've taken that money to, to do stuff um, with sort of collaborative robots. I haven't ever put a gun on a robot. I don't want to. I, I won't do that. But um, there's this sort of ethical question that you have to grapple with um, <coughs> with these technologies. You know, especially, you know, this is very direct, like it's something that's supposed to hurt people and you're giving this power into people's hands, and you have to decide how to use it. So, so I thought this was an interesting um, situation to sort of think about. Um, let's see. So this was another one I really liked. Um, and there was a few about education. This wasn't the only one that was talking about using robots in education. And as you guys know, at least those of you who were here last time, I was a robot in education last class, because I came in, in the beam and, instead of coming in, in real life. So I was in this telepresence robot. Um, and that was, I've been wanting to do a full lecture in the beam. I, I'm actually wondering if you guys think that would be a good idea or a terrible idea. It would be so cool. It would be so cool. <laughs> What's that? It might be a little distracting. I was afraid it would be a little distracting. That's why I decided I would do it on the day Stephen was here. As a <laughs> so that, I mean, maybe it was distracting then too, but like at least I wouldn't be lecturing and trying to make the beam work and, and dealing with that distraction. We could kind of pilot test it first. Um, most of you seem to say it's a good idea. Maybe next semester we'll, we'll give that a try. 
Um, so so um, people are also talking about um, you know, using, and this is sort of education and, and, and AI, but like using robots in education. And there's actually a lot of really interesting work in robotics that's studying the effect of a robot helping you do something or a robot teaching you something versus a, a, an agent on a computer screen with the same sort of affect and the same voice and the same look, but on a flat screen instead of in, in, a re, in, the real, in real life. And it turns out that people actually react very differently to a robot than they do to the agent on the, on the computer screen. So, so um, one of these studies was like about a weight loss robot. So it was a really simple little thing. It was like basically this PC with a, a face that tracked your face. That was like the robotic part of it. It would look for a face and it would look at you. And then it would have this keyboard and mouse interface to ask you questions about what you've been eating and have you been exercising today and, and tracking your calories. And it would offer advice about how to do that better. So like if you said that you had a big greasy cheese pizza, it might suggest adding a salad to that. Or if you had an exercise, it might suggest going out for a run. And they had the robotic version of this compared with a computer-based version where you're asking the same questions and stuff, but there was no robot. And it turned out that people used the robot a lot longer. They named it, they would put hats on it, and, and, and they engaged with it much longer than they used either a computer system or a journal, like a, a paper journal, which is another way people tell, they tell people to, to lose weight um, over, over a six-week study. And there's a sort of body of, of this work. Um, there's this other st uh, body of research where they use robots to influence people. So, the robot teaches you something. It's like a tour guide at a museum or something. And you can either watch a movie of an, of an agent doing something, or you can watch the robot um, do it. Or you got, it, it. Some of these studies have to have a video of the robot on a screen or the robot. And then they ask you questions You know, 20 minutes later. They ask you, what did the robot tell you? And they ask you questions about it. And people answer the, the questions when the robot was in real life more accurately than if it was the robot on the screen, even though it's the same information and, and all that, like the physical presence of it, of it seems to matter a lot. This is kind of weird, um, but very suggestive for, for education. So I think that's kind of a, of a fun application area to think about. Uh, so that was, so I like that one. Um, and then this one I, I, I also liked because it was sort of my, like related to my beam experience last week. Um, so this idea of having a robot that um, is going to be your double, it's going to go out when you don't ha uh, for you when you don't have to. Um, and, and I think this is, an, like, so, so again, talking about the beam, like, you know, the, this whole idea of telepresence robots. So these are teleoperated robots, not a whole ton of autonomy. The beam, is, like, it's like, it's like driving Pac-Man around or something. You're just, you know, pushing arrow keys. I'm pushing arrow keys on my keyboard to go forwards and backwards and turn, and I'm looking at a the feed from the video to control where it is. I don't have hands, which is kind of frustrating. I can't open doors. And I can't ride elevators because the elevator's a really great Faraday cage. And so, <laughs> so I can go in the elevator, but I can't come back out again. <laughs> uh, I had to have somebody help me to go to different floors and, and, and stuff like that. But on the other hand, like I actually went to Bruce Schneer's talk last week on uh, on Thursday on the beam after class and that was like you know I wasn't here I didn't get on the train and leave my house I just was on this robot and it was enabling me to do something that I couldn't have done without that technology yes well, this kind of thing became more prevalent they could just make open elevators Yes, so there are technical solutions. Um, you, could, you, could, you could make the elevator out of non-metallic material or something so it wasn't a Faraday cage or you could put a extra wireless access point somehow in the elevator such that you could um, talk to it. And one of the things about the Beam, like to, to um, they, the company that makes the Beam, it's called Suitable Technologies, they have like a subdivision that will come to your site and do an, a wireless hot analysis. Because dead zones are really bad, right? Like if you drive into a wireless dead zone, like actually if you come out the elevator downstairs and I go out the back way, I'm fine. Like once I get out of the elevator, I'm okay. If I come out the front way, I'm, I'm in trouble because it's a dead zone, right? It just turns out that like, right out in front of those elevators is a dead zone um, for the wireless network, and it doesn't work. And so they come in and they study your network and they help you eliminate dead zones. So, so like we, I, don't, I don't actually see our access point, but we must have one. Does anybody see it? Where? Is it up on top there? Maybe. Yeah, we, we, we probably have one in this room. Otherwise, it's outside somewhere. Um, 
But see, like, you know, the fact that we don't have one might mean that we have a dead zone in this room. This is really weird, actually. I'm surprised we don't have one in this room. But if you go outside in the lobby, I'm sure you'll be able to find an access point. And it has antennas, and they're pointing in different directions. And what they'll do is like help you point the antennas in, in better directions. And they'll help you decide, well, maybe we do need one in this room on a different channel so that they don't interfere and, and all these problems that can happen um, to make the beam work. And we've actually had to do that with, our, with, our, uh, with the CIT people here. Um, they actually gave us our own wireless network. If you see our lab around on your list of networks, that's our network. That's the robotics lab network, our lab. And it's just for the beam so that we don't have to compete with all of you guys <laughs> doing all the stuff that you're doing when we're, when we're trying to make our robot go somewhere. Um, so is there a question in the back? OK. All right. So, so I think thinking about these things are, are, are really fun. And that's actually some of the things I hope you guys take with you as we finish up this class, you know, think of thinking about how this can, how you can use this technology to change the world. What problems can this technology solve that you couldn't solve before? And, and, and I hope you find a lot of them. I hope you all make the world a better place. Uh, okay, so the final review. So let me take this off and put this on. So this was like our first slide from the <laughs> from the first lecture. <laughs> um, we can all get sentimental about it. Um, all right, so, so uh, we sort of, I, I don't know how you guys want to do this. I can sort of give a lightning overview of everything going really, really fast. That's what I was thinking I would do. And then, and then if you want, I can stop and ask questions during it, or we can go back over it more slowly and you can stop and ask questions. I think what I'll do is like do a lightning review really, really fast with no questions. And then I'll go back to the beginning of the slide deck, and we can go through it more slowly, and you can ask questions. But that'll give you like the my view of like the synthesis of what we're doing. Uh, and before I do that, I'll say one more thing about the final. Um, we're trying, I, I am, one of the things I'm a little worried is that we made the course too easy. And so we're trying to make the final harder than the, <laughs> than the, than the previous, than the midterm and, and then the homeworks have been. So I don't want you guys to get scared when you, when you find that, if, if that turns out. I don't actually know if it's going to be the case, but I think it will be the case. So I don't want you to get scared when you're taking the final. We will take it into account. Like if we m totally miscalibrate it, we'll curve it. We're not going to you know, give you guys all zeros if the final <laughs> turns out to be completely off base. Um, but I did want to take it as an opportunity to really assess not just how well you've done, but how well we've done at teaching the things we're trying to learn, like, like how well you can apply this knowledge in slightly different problems from the ones that we've seen in the semester, how you can integrate concepts from different units together in, in one problem and use them to uh, explain what's going on, understand what's going on in, in different scenarios. So the best way to study for the final, again, is to do problems. Um, going back to the homework problems, going to the textbook, and trying to do the problems, if you have to go back and read to do, do them or talk to a TA, that's, that's fine. We're, we're happy to, to answer your questions. Um, but, but that act of doing the problem, getting your brain working in that, thinking in that AI way, is what we're trying to assess in, in the final. Does that make sense? OK. All right. So we sort of started out with this algorithm for how can we make machines that, that act rationally and we had this, um, you know, search this algorithm, right, for action and all actions. We're going to somehow decide how good that action is, and then we're going to pick the best action and, and go off and execute it. This was our, you know, five lines for all of AI. <coughs> and, you know, inside of score could be a lot of complicated things. We talked about probability and, and utility as ways of quantifying how good things were in, in the world. Um, enumerating the actions could be really tricky. You might not know the effect of your action, um, so that's going to have to get baked into your score function. Um, you might know it, but the search space might be really big, and you might have to take that into account. And we talked about sort of the heuristic searches and, and, and stuff like that. Um, you, might, you might have to learn to do this over time, and that's sort of the, the RL version of things. You're trying to get feedback from the world as to how good this action is, and then use that later on to pick better actions. And then there was this whole family of algorithms, uh, which you guys are just finishing in your, in your project, um, to do that. So the sort of outline for this, for the course, was, was uh, search and planning. We had the Pac-Man project, which was pretty fun. And then, um, oh, what happened? My slides crashed.
That's the second time this happened, I think. Wonder why. All right, so we had Pac-Man, then we had uncertainty. So that was like Jane's and the rules, the quantitative rules, the product rule, and the sum rule. And um, the project was localization in a particle filter. So you were trying to figure out where this robot is uh, in, a, in, a, in a different environment. Uh, and you guys implemented particle filters at the end. We talked about graphical models in that section uh, and Bayes filters. And we implemented a Bayes filter, a simple Bayes filter in lecture. And then you guys sort of saw how particle filters how that all cashed out as a particle filter. Um, then we talked about making decisions. So that was uh, our little dive into machine learning. And we talked about naive Bayes and logistic regression. Uh, so here's, this is, these are the slides I used at the beginning of the semester to explain the course too. So it's nice to go back and revisit them. So this was the email from, you know, last, from January about the spam that I got. And, and, and you guys made classifiers to, decide whether or not this was spam or ham. You did with any Bayes logistic regression. We also talked about support vector machines as a sort of more discriminative approach. And we talked a little bit about decision trees and, and neural networks. Um, there's sort of this whole family of machine learning algorithms. And, and we talked about the different functions that they can support. So here's our ROC curve for where you want to be based on your utility, right? So, so you, you can have a probability of knowing something is spam or ham from the model, but you also need to know the cost to find the right, the cost of a, of a false positive versus a false negative to figure out where you want to be on, on this curve. And then we finally, at, at this last unit, we, we, we generalize this one step more to making sequences of decisions. So we're not just making one decision about what to do, but we're making multiple decisions over time. Um, and we talked about this, so this was MDPs, Markov decision processes, partially observable Markov decision processes, and, and uh, reinforcement learning. And those were like the, the topics. And the project was um, implementing Q-learning and RMAX uh, in, in this uh, game with Wally. And, and we talked about applications to, of this technology to robotics. And it kind of puts everything together in, in, in one integrated framework. OK. Um, so that's sort of the high, I guess we, we started out with like, with like the search algorithm, which is like the one slide version of this course. This was like the 10-slide version. Um, what I have next, maybe I'll stop there. That's kind of a, a good sum summary overview of what's going on. I have a bunch of slides of like highlights of more specific things from the course, things like admissibility and consistency of heuristics and, and, and stuff like that. But maybe I'll stop there and open it up for questions so we can sort of target what you're most interested in. Yeah. Obviously, the, pro uh, the projects and the homework didn't yeah. cover every single type of algorithm that you yes. discussed in class. How familiar do we need to be with the ones we never dealt with? Um, we're not expecting you, even for ones that you have dealt with, we're trying to make, like, we're trying to provide scaffolding on the final. So we're putting, like, pseudocode or diagrams in. Um, for some things like breadth and depth first search, you should be pretty comfortable with them. You should be comfortable, just like I was able to do in class, like, open up an Emacs window and code it up. You should be able to do that. Um, but we're not going to make you expect you to regurgitate, let's say, alpha beta pruning without pseudocode. Does that answer your question? OK. Yeah. Do we need to know how deseparation works? Um, deseparation is right now not on the final. Um, and I think that's the thing. I feel like I, I screwed it up. I probably should have covered it. And I think next semester, like, officially covered it. And, I, and, and we had it, we had it in, the ho in the homework, and it was kind of confusing. And I definitely intend to do a better job of it uh, next year. Um, what is going to be on the final is we are going to expect you to be able to interpret a graphical model, so, so understand what random variables are, understand the mapping between a Bayes net uh, or a model, a, a directed graphical model, and the factor, corresponding factorization of the model. Um, thinking about that in terms of CPTs, conditional probability tables, which we spent a lot of time doing, and understanding the relation of all of that to something like a particle filter. So the connection between the math all the way down to the particle filter and the code is, is, is definitely something we're interested in, in testing. 
Um, we, should be, we should be comfortable with the, the sum rule and the product rule. Um, we've gone through it in class, like, 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 um, so for things like the Bayes filter with the measurement update and, and the time update. We've gone through where those come from and, and why those work. You should be comfortable with that. You should, like one way you could practice that is like, like kind of going through the derivation yourself of the measurement update and the time update uh, and, and making sure you're understanding the independence assumptions that are made and why the, the factorization works the way it does, what rules are, are being used to, to make that happen. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, I think I have a slide a little bit about this somewhere. Yes, I do. This one. Um, so we talked about this a few times in the course, um, plans versus policies. So in, the, in, a cer in sort of a classic search problem, like Pac-Man or chess or something. Like, it's not chess because it's adversarial, but like, um, uh, like the eight puzzle where you, you, in some sense, you know everything there is to know about the world. You know the states, you know all the states. You know from that state, you know all the actions you can take. You know the transition function and you know the reward function, okay? You know all that. That's, there's no uncertainty about it. There's no ambiguity about what might happen. There's no opponent who is trying to mess with you like there is in chess or in tic-tac-toe. Um, and, and so when you're trying to figure out what to do, it's okay to just have a pre-specified script that you're going to follow. You're just going to play out the sequence of actions that you found. And that's, call, that's what's called a plan. Um, when you start, and that's sort of like breadthford search, depthford search, A star, you know the search. It might be really, really big. And so it might be, and like, that's sort of like why, like you might, you know, be able in theory to find the plan, but like how do you actually go from like knowing the search space to actually having the sequence of actions you're going to execute today in this search space for this problem? That's where breadthford search, depthford search, A star, greedy local search, all that stuff comes in. And, and the key thing is that we know enough about the problem that once we have that sequence of actions, we know that nothing is going to knock us off our, our script. We don't think that cosmic rays are going to come in and flip bits in our eight puzzle and, and cause this move to suddenly become impossible. Okay? Um, in contrast with this, um, the stuff we're doing now, and we even talked about this back in, in the search puzzles where we, we talked about um, local, for, local search and, and that version of depth for search that was doing it when you were moving through a real environment and you didn't know the whole environment. In that instance, we, and also in games, right, where you don't know what the opponent's going to do. So if you're playing tic-tac-toe, you don't know what response they're going to make. So if you just decide, I'm going to put an X here and then I'm going to put an X there, they might have put an O there and, and, and your plan isn't going to work anymore. So, so this was sort of this distinction between a plan and a policy where a policy says what to do no matter what happens. A plan is just like this one sequence of actions. This is what I'm going to do, and, and, and if I go off script, it doesn't say anything about what, what's, what happens then. And what people will do often, if you have a planner, it, it can give you the sequence of actions, and you do go off script for some reason, they'll just run the planner again from wherever you are right now, and that'll give you a new sing, single sequence of actions that you can roll out, and you can run that until it, it goes off script. And that will convert your planner into something that gives you a policy. That's called forward search. We didn't talk about this in, in class once, but we didn't talk about this in class much. I think I may, may have mentioned it a few times. But, um, but it's, it's sort of the simplest way to convert a plan to a policy. Uh, but you can, uh, and, and people actually use it a lot because it's, it's, it's this, this sort of very simple, uh, easy little thing to do. Um, but the things with um, the model learning that we did with RMAX and the TD error estimation and, and stuff like that can often do better. Uh, and, and, and people will also do those, those types of algorithms to give you a policy as opposed to a plan. Does that, does that, does that make sense? Okay. More questions? Yes? Um, so in reinforcement learning, yeah. when you were talking about the different types of algorithms, yeah. um, you said there's like a policy-based one. Yeah, I think I have this one here. One. Yes. Uh, can you go over those and describe like which agents fall under which Yes. Mm. Here. 
This slide? Yeah, OK. All right, so we talked about this. And this is something else I think I should have done better from, from a lecture point of view. I think it might have been better to go more systematically through each of these types and, and spend some more time in lecture on RMAX. Because I'm, I'm hearing from the TAs that there was a lot of questions about how to implement the RMAX algorithm. Um, so, so basically, maybe I'll, I'll back up a little bit to sort of MDP. You have an MDP, right? So states, actions, transition functions, reward function. And then we talked about the Bellman equation, which is the utility of each state. So not just the reward from being in that state, but the long-term benefit, the long-term benefit I get from being in that state and doing good things forever after. So like this, this discounted reward over time um, as, I, as, I, as, I, as I play time forward. And then we talked about value iteration. Uh, so this was an algorithm where if I knew if I knew S, A, T, and R, if I know all that stuff, but T is still, so, so like I still need a policy, going back to your question, because my transition function could be non-deterministic. Um, but at least I know it. So it might be the case that like if I, if I go out that door, uh, the elevator might be there, and it might not be there. And you know, it's going to be there 10% of the time, and it's going to be not there 90% of the time. But I know that. I know 10% it's going it's to be there, and 90% it's not going to be there. And if I know that, and, and I, maybe I get a cookie if I get to go down the elevator quickly as possible. If I know that, then I can solve it. So, so this was the value iteration algorithm. Um, and it was basically doing these little Bellman updates to try to estimate the utility of being in each state, and then picking the action that gave you the highest expected utility at every time step. So that's sort of not even reinforcement learning, but like just solving MDPs. And it's, I think it's important to, to have that in your head before we start to talk about the RL. Algorithms, yes? And so when we're doing value iteration, we have to make the assumption that our transition function is a probability. Yes. We, we don't, we don't have, I mean, ha we, we have to know that it's a probability. It could be a, 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 a zero, one probability distribution. And then it'll get really easy. Like, like um, we won't, this summation here uh, it will be all zeros except for where it's a one, and, and we'll just pass the utility back. Um, but. But yes, we it incorporate. It's able to handle non-deterministic state transitions. Is is a better way to say it, I think. Yes. If you have a deterministic MDP, can yeah. you then just get a plan and not worry about using? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So if you if it was all deterministic state transitions, we're back in planning because we know what's going to happen. We don't need to figure out our expected discounted reward and and all that stuff. We can just figure out what to do because we know for sure how the world's going to evolve. Okay, so this is a spectrum of problems, right? And it's important to think, like, like this sort, in terms of the spectrum, it's important when you have your problem, you can make often, like, like basically all problems are like POM DPs, right? They're, they're crazy hard, we don't know anything, it's always noisy, and, and, and if we stopped there, we wouldn't, we wouldn't get anywhere. A lot of times when we approach these AI problems, we're deciding, I'm gonna, even though, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna decide that even though you know, moving through an environment, if I'm a real robot, like it's, it's crazy hard, I'm gonna just go to the A star version of this where I know the whole map and I'm gonna assume I can move deterministically and, and I'm gonna make these assumptions which dramatically simplify my problem. And that game of like deciding which assumptions you're gonna make and that, you know, makes your model simple, it makes it not necessarily reflect exactly what's going on in the real world, but it also makes it possible to solve. That game is the game that you play when you go out and apply this technology in the world. OK, so going back to the RL question, we, we sort of talked about MDPs, states, actions, transition functions, reward. And if we have all those things, it's easy. We know how to solve it. Um, so now we get to the reinforcement learning problem. So in the reinforcement learning, if I go back to the, to the MDP slide, sorry about the POM DP digression there, um, I don't get these things. OK, RL says, what do I do if I don't get to know T and I don't get to know R? But I do get, you know, I'm just plopped, in, plopped down in a world somewhere, and I get to take actions, and sometimes I get pats on the head, and sometimes I get, you know, bonks on the head. <laughs> I sometimes get cookies, and I sometimes get kicked. And that's my reward function, as I take different actions. And over time, I want to learn to get lots and lots of cookies and not get kicked. That's, the, that's what you're trying to do in an, in an RL problem. Now, if I knew where I was going to get cookies, that's what this is going to tell me, and I knew how my actions affected the world, 
I would be back in an MDP, I could do value iteration. But if I'm not, I'm just, I, I, I'm in this sort of harder version of the world. So the RL sort of hierarchy of, there's different ways to cut this up too, but the way that, that we've talked about um, is sort of different ways to approach this problem. And maybe I'll start at the bottom because that's kind of the closest to the MDP. So the model-based way was RMAX. That's, that's the algorithm you guys implemented that was uh, model-based. Um, so what did you do for RMAX? What, what did you have to estimate? We're essentially using our past experience to estimate the transition and the reward. Exactly, yeah. So you were using the, the past experience to estimate transition and reward. And then once you had estimates, what did you do? Somebody else. Somebody who hasn't answered in a long time. Sure. Use value right. Yeah. So we could just solve our, problem, our MDP just like we knew everything. We just pretend that what we estimated was the right thing and use that to get a policy. Now, RMAX is one way of doing this. There's lots of variants and there's lots of tricks that, that you could play in, in the way that, that you could do this estimation. Um, and this is just one way. Um, but the idea of a model-based way is that somehow at the end of the day, you can actually say, this is, this is what I think my transition function is. Or maybe if I'm a Bayesian, this is my distribution over transition functions. But like something about what the transition function is and what the reward function actually is. And then I can do lots of different things with that. I could solve the POMDP. I could just tell you, like maybe it's useful for you to know what the transition function and reward function is if, if you don't have a good model of, of that space. Um, there's, there's sort of um, different things you could do. So the next thing, you know, backing off from that though, because it's a lot to, as you guys found, implementing RMAX is kind of complicated. There's a lot of parameters you're kind of keeping track of and, and you had this kind of arbitrary cutoffs for when you should uh, stop exploring and start exploiting and it was kind of weird. So the, another thing that you could do is, is basically try, to, instead of estimating the transition and reward and using those to compute a value function, directly estimate the value function. That was our utility function. So if we go back to our Bellman equation, from, from value iteration, like, like in value iteration, we took the um, transition matrix and the reward matrix and we iteratively estimated u. And once we had u, we could get a policy. In reinforcement learning, in, in these value-based methods, we're gonna directly estimate u. We're never gonna, f we're never gonna have any estimate for what our r is or for what our t is. We're just going to estimate u or q. So for q learning, we remember there was the two versions of the value function. Um, if we did just estimate u, we actually would have to do t to plug it in. Um, but if we, if we did q, we didn't even need t. Right? We could just estimate that value function, the, the value of being in a state and taking a certain action. And if our estimate was good, we could just, op we just pick that action and that was it. Um, so that, that would give us something like q learning and there's, again, a lot of tricks. So there's SARSA, um, which is another kind of a, a variant of, of Q-learning. We talked a little bit about linear function approximation methods to estimate the value function and, and, and stuff like that. Um, the idea is at the end of the learning, I would tell you the value function. If you asked me if I was in this state and I took this action and you said, what's the value? I would be able to tell you. And I might be wrong, but like, I would tell you what I thought it was. Um, that's the thing that I'm estimating. Um, but even that is kind of... I don't know, it's a, it's, it's a, a value function is a very powerful thing, right? Like it's telling me something about the future under the, po under the optimal policy. The value function is kind of a big deal. So something even simpler and even maybe less ambitious is to say, you know what, I'm not even gonna think about the value function at all. I'm just gonna try to pick actions that are good actions. Um, so that's, that gets you into policy search based methods. Um, and the way that these work, and these often work, these are used a lot in robotics because they can work very well in practice if you are in the, the right space of policies. And the reason that this can be very effective is that you, the designer, can pick the space of policies that you're searching over. And you can pick it to be a really good space. So like if there's, if the space of all, you can imagine kind of enumerating, you know, all the possible policies that you could have and it's really, really big. And somewhere in here is the optimal policy. Now, if you are smart about how you pick the, the, the search space of policies and policy search, you might pick a really small space, and that could make the problem a lot easier. 
Now, if you're, if, if you're not so lucky, this might be the really small space that you pick. And that might not be so good. Um, so you can really you can get tanked in these in these methods if if you pick uh, a bad policy space and they also they use local methods they're not, they're often not a global globally optimal policy so you might have picked the right space but it might have not converged to a, a global optimum um, when it does this estimate um, but you can sort of think of it as like 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 the the the, the you know simplest version of all is like I'm just going to pick a policy just randomly sample a policy from the space. And then I'm going to try it for 10 turns or something, or run it for a while. And then I see how much reward I get from it. And, if it's, and, then, I, and then I try another one, and I keep doing that, and I pick the best policy I found. Now, you can do better than that with gradient-based methods, where you, if you found something good, you try to change it a little bit and see if you can get better and go up the gradient. Um, but the sort of, without even doing that, you can have a policy-based method where you're just picking a policy, trying it out, and picking another policy, trying it out, and pick the best one. There's no value function. There's no transition or reward matrix. I can't tell you anything about how the world evolves or what the state action value is or anything like that. All I can tell you is this is the best policy I've found so far. Does that, does that help? Yeah. OK. And this was like the summary that we had. OK. What else? All right, I can keep going. I can go back to the beginning of this little slide deck, and we can kind of see if different things st stoke your memory. Oh, interesting. All right. Did that work good? OK. So we talked about formulating. This was like going back to the beginning, right? Formulating a problem, states, actions, tradition models, goal test, path cost. And we had uh, uh, some discussion posts about doing that, and, 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 and sort of we had a question in the midterm about that. So you should be comfortable with this way of thinking about the world. And, and you know, there was something where it's kind of tricky. So if you go back to the textbook, they talked about like the, that eight puzzle. It's a little tricky, maybe, to think about that as a search problem. Um, but that leap of, of, of how you can think of this as, as states in action, what you actually stick in the, in the state. Uh, is is uh, important to being able to apply these these kinds of technologies and that insight that oh this is really an AI problem this is really a search problem is often the one that people will have that, that makes this that that, so, that makes them figure out how to apply AI in, in their problem. Then we talked about breadth first and depth first search uninformed search where you, you didn't know the the cost of different nodes um, and then we switched over to informed search. Greedy search, Dijkstra's algorithm, A star search, and we had that sort of general tree search, and we were just changing the order of how things came off our our um, our visited nodes data structure. And if it was a different order, we would get different algorithms. So we had breadth first and depth first when you just had a stack or a queue, and then we had priority queue and last uh, and and these cost based ones for a priority queue for 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 these guys to with different. Um, Cost. So in the Dijkstra's algorithm, it was just the cost. In A star, we introduced the idea of a heuristic. Um, so heuristics, we talked a lot about heuristics. Um, you should be comfortable with the idea of what a heuristic is, why it can help. Um, you should be comfortable coming up with heuristics. So you guys did that a lot in the in the Pac-Man problem, and it might be worth going back and kind of practicing, maybe redoing parts of it, and and making sure that you can. And create these heuristics and then identify whether they're admissible or consistent. So admissible was never overestimate the cost to reach the goal, but it didn't say anything about, you know, as long as it's not overestimating, the, 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 the value at one node didn't have to be related to the value at another node, as long as they were both overestimates. Whereas consistent says they have to obey the triangle in the inequality. So this is like relating the heuristic at one node, the heuristic at another node, in terms of the cost from going to n, <coughs> taking action a and ending up at n, pri n, n prime. Um, so, so, if, uh, so it's sort of forcing the whole function to be consistent, self-consistent across the, the search graph. Um, and this was our example of admissible and not consistent um, here, was this probabilistic one, where we were still always overestimating, but sometimes we would pick the, the other value and, and uh, 
And so the value at one node wouldn't be, wouldn't be consistent with values at other nodes. Yes? Um, so in the midterm mm -hmm. question, <coughs> but if you have multiple heuristics and you know they're all admissible and you want to use, like, mm -hmm. use all this information mm -hmm. as an answer with taking the maximum of, uh, estimate out of all of them, uh -huh. I was wondering that if, even if all of your heuristics are consistent amongst each other, yes. is the strategy of choosing the max value yes. of all of them also guarantee consistency? Um. No. no. So, can we come up with a counterexample? I mean, yeah. And you failed the consistency <laughs> test. So there was there is a counterexample. Yeah. Um, I can I can see that happening if you if you had like the max, unlike like a summation or something, is going to give you kind of nonlinearities in in the way that you're combining these values together. So so I think that's where that would come from. Yeah? But it'll still be admissible if you take the max, it's not Yes, because it's always going to overestimate. Yeah. Yes? So what does having an inconsistent heuristic do? What does it having an inconsistent heuristic do? Yeah. Um, we didn't really talk about this much in class. Um, but you, th there, there, there is a notion of better heuristics versus worse heuristics, right? So if you have a heuristic where the, the estimate for this, like, uh, you know, for the cost to reach the goal is always 100. You know, it's admissible, it's not consistent, and it's not going to tell you all that much because it's the same for all the different nodes, right? So, so, the, so the problem is that um, it's, it's not a very useful heuristic. And essentially, the, as you get more and more consistent, you, you get more useful, right? Because you're, you're sort of relating yourself to all the other nodes. So it's not going to send you down the wrong path. Eventually, if you, even if you go down the wrong path, if it's admissible, you'll get corrected and you'll, and you'll go down the right path. You'll find the optimal thing. If it's not admissible, you might find the non-optimal path. Um, if it's consistent, it's going to be better, sort of generally. Um, that doesn't mean you couldn't come up with heuristics that are admissible that are worse than heuristics that are consistent, admissible but not consistent, that are, that perform better than ones that are consistent, like, because you could. Um, but it's sort of, uh, if you can sort of imagine the same heuristic and then you fix it up, like, like this, this example here, where you fix it up to make it um, admissible and consistent, it would be better, give you more information. Yes? Um, do you need consistency to guarantee optimality? Or like that, Easter will find the optimal path because I think it finds the optimal path for admissible heuristics. But if you're having, if you don't satisfy that triangle inequality, mm -hmm. can't that throw off like your priorities, and can't you visit a lower priority? Like I th before your, or it just it just needs to be admissible. I think it, as long as you're not overestimating, you're going to come back. So if if because eventually what's going to happen is you're going to get to the goal. So, so like if you're if you're if you're admissible, you're never overestimating. Eventually, you're going to get to the goal, like, and, and, and you send you off in the wrong direction, right? So, like, there's two paths. Let's say, like, this is one of our examples. And this was the start, and this was the goal. And there was one that was Wait, like this. Right? Yeah, sorry, I will erase. Okay, so if this is your start, and then we had a path that kind of looked good, and then it went off to who knows where, and then it came back to the goal, versus a more straightforward path. Um, so let's say that the, the true path costs are sort of corresponding to the, to the line length here. If my heuristic sends me up here and, and then down here, eventually I'm going to reach the goal. I'm going to know the true cost of this path, the real cost, not the heuristic's estimate of the cost. So the heuristic is going to send me down the wrong path. I'm going to get here, and then I'm going to do the, the check of like, well, how good does my true cost of this look with my estimated cost of this? And as long as I'm not overestimating, right? If I overestimate it, I'd be like, oh, I'm done, right? But if I'm not overestimating, so if I'm admissible, I'll come back and I'll try doing this, and I'll be like, okay, this is the optimal path. And I did have to search the whole graph to find that out. Um, but I, I didn't find a suboptimal trajectory. Does that, does that, does that answer your question? Yes, definitely. Kay. So it's, it's just helpful in that it reduces the number of nodes you actually have to expand. 
Right. So, so a consistent heuristic wouldn't, w once it got up here, it would be like, wait a minute, you know, and would come back and do this. So it would, would have saved having to do this jump. And yes? Yeah, according to the textbook, it says um, that for, uh, for tree search, um, uh, emissibility is fine. Uh, it, it's, yeah. it's enough to shut off the mountain. Yes. It says a second slightly stronger condition called consistency is required for applications of A star to grass search. But then in the footnote, they say with an admissible but inconsistent heuristic, A star requires extra bookkeeping to require optimality. Okay. So it does seem like opt, uh, the, um, admissibility is, is enough to ensure optimality. However, uh, they sort of hand wave like, the reasoning. Um, but consistency is generally going to lead you to a, a shorter. A yeah. Shorter Consistency kind of is what you expect, right? Like you, you, you expect your heuristic to, like you, you kind of want this to be true. Like that the true cost is related to the heuristic in this way. It's, it's, it's like saying, I'm, I'm not just going to pull these numbers out of a hat. I'm going to relate them to the true cost in, in some principled way. OK, more questions about heuristics. Yes? Is there a general strategy for coming up with a heuristic that's both admissible and consistent if max is not worth the consistency? Um, you kind of have to use your intuition and, and, and basically think about how you can get an estimate of the distance from where you are to the goal. And it's actually pretty hard. So, so like we've thought about this for some of our, like, so for like Euclidean problems and Euclidean space, Euclidean distance is really nice. Um, it's really tricky when you think about like, you know, you're a robot and you're following a recipe and you'd like to use A star to, to get there. Like what heuristic can you <coughs> use to, you know, to estimate the distance between your current state and the goal of the recipe like bread or something like that. Um, you know, the, it, maybe you could imagine like the true distance in the graph, but like you, you have to search to find that out. Um, you can think about trying to estimate it from data. So maybe you, you look at, you solve a lot of true graphs and then give, have a machine learning algorithm estimate your heuristic, but then it might not be admissible or consistent. Some might help you, um, and, but you might be able to prove that it's admissible or, or consistent. Um, and, and so for some of the, for the eight puzzle, you kind of had to be tricky about it. Um, you know, the, the distance of, of the state from, from the goal state, you kind of had to think about, well, what does it mean to move a tile to the goal? Like the minimum number of moves to, to, to make this the goal state is, is, is the sort of the number of the Manhattan distance between each tile and its correct, uh, its correct location. And that kind of, tra like there is kind of a distance metric there. It's often a moment of like having an insight about how you can relate different states of the problem to each other. So, so kind of thinking about two states that intuitively seem like like you should be able to tell that this is closer than this. So like, you know, this, is, these are start states and goal states, but like, I don't know, like let's say two and three were reversed. Intuitively, that kind of seems like a better place to be than the start state. And if you can try to formalize that intuition, that will often lead you to a heuristic. And then you can have to ask yourself, is it admissible and consistent and do I care? Um, is it good, do I, do maybe I don't care if I have the optimal path. Does that, does that help? All right, we already talked about this, plans versus policies. Um, we'll talk about it again. This was like the idea of an adversarial search tree. So this was one example where this comes up. Um, this was sort of showing the two-ply game tree where you, know, you really might like to get 12, but, but B here isn't going to help you do that. He's going to pick three, so you might do better. Or fifth, there we go. You might like to get 15, but, but but the min player is going to pick two, so, that, so even if you take action A3, you're, not, you're never going to get this 14 reward. So you're stuck um, over here getting three, right? So, so this idea of not have, getting control over all the, the way that the state space evolves, need, causing you to need a, a policy. Um, uncertainty. Um, so our, our dive into Jane's and these desiderata, like degrees of plausibility are represented by real numbers, qualitative correspondence with common sense, consistency. So if you can reason out in one, more than one way, then every possible way should lead to the same result. You want to take into account all of the evidence relevant to a question. You don't want to ignore information. 
and you represent equal states of knowledge by equal states of plausibility assignments. And then that gave us the product rule and the sum rule. So our consistency basically gave us this need for the product rule. Um, and you could, of course, do it in both directions. And, um, and then combine a few of these together. So like equal states of plausibility had to be equal. We also used the product rule and consistency to get that they all have to sum to one. Um, and we decided, remember, there was, it could be, um, it could be uh, minus infinity and, and zero, or it could, it could be between zero and one. And we decided, I don't know why we, the civilization, decided to, to pick zero and one, but we did. And, and that's the rules that we're all familiar with. Um, so you should be comfortable. You don't have to know all this, all this math, although I think it's really cool. I, I, I spent a lot of time reading that, that book, and I think it's really fun. Um, you should definitely know the sum rule and the product rule, and you should be comfortable manipulating probabilistic equations. You should be comfortable mapping between propositions and probability distributions. This was from our formalization uh, stuff, and then we talked. Um, so you should be comfortable getting to a, a form like this and using the sum rule and product rule <laughs> to transform it into different, different forms. Um, this was sort of the graphical model version of all of this, so we talked about Bayes nets. This is a random variable, multinomial. Remember, we collapsed our propositions when they're mutually exclusive and exhaustive. We got um, a multinomial random variable that ranged over each of these three alternatives. I'm in the kitchen, I'm in the bedroom, I'm in the living room. This was our model of localization uh, from, from lecture. And that led to a graphical model with this factorization where we're assuming things are conditionally independent given. So this is my observation of different pieces of furniture. And we're saying they're conditionally independent given A. That led to this factorization. So you'd be comfortable going from this to this. And then tables. So we had these probability tables where we were computing marginal distributions and conditional distributions using Bayes' rule. And I'm not showing you how, where these numbers came from, but you guys had a bunch of homeworks about this, and it was on the midterm and, and stuff. You should be comfortable doing these kinds of computations. OK. Um, we talked about Bayes filtering as an application of this. So this was like not using CPTs, conditional probability tables, but using particle filters. Um, the model is kind of the sequence model. There's this repeating pattern where there's an input, a state, and a measurement. And uh, at each step, you take a measurement, and then you get a control input that causes you to evolve with noise. And then that takes you to the next state and the, and the next state. Um, so you, yes? Could you talk maybe a little bit about how particle filters are a subset of Bayesian filters? Um, OK. Yeah, how they relate to Bayes filters, yeah. Um, so here's our, our algorithm, Bayes filter. So basically, this integral is, is it's a, and we didn't require calculus, so I don't want to make there be an integral, but like there's, this could be a summation in, in, in discrete probability land. This integral c cannot always be computed in closed form. So when we did this in class, if you remember, we made enough assumptions that this was a summation over a pretty small set, and we were just doing it. We, we, had, we summed up the array, and we got our, our, our estimate. Does that? Maybe I should talk about the measurement uh, probability and the observation probability. So like we're, this is incorporating our measurement. So, at every, so, so the idea of a Bayes filter is an iterative algorithm, and at every step, I am maintaining my belief over where I am in the environment, over my state. And I do this by flipping back and forth between the measurement update and, and the time update, the control update, basically. So this one here is the control update, where I take my current estimate of the state, I integrate that, I, I, I marginalize out the, where I could be based on my control input without looking at the world. I'm closing my eyes right now. I'm just, I just know that I turn my motors on for 10 seconds. And this is, says something about, well, if I'm really here, if I'm really at this location and I turn my motors on for 10 seconds, this is a distribution over where I think I'll end up. And this is the distribution over where I think I am right now. Okay? So I'm, I'm summing out over where I am uh, where I am right now and getting a distribution over, so this should be x sub t minus 1, and I'm getting a distribution over where I think I am before I look, but after I've moved. Okay? That's like step one. 
of, th of the base filter. And then step two is incorporating the um, measure, my observation, right? I observe the world, and, and this, 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 remember this thing was really complicated in, in class, and, but it worked out, like, like it, it basically is the summation with Bayes' rule where I'm summing out over, um, over the, 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 the places that I could be. And, 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 I, and using that, I correct my estimate of the measurement. So that means that over time, as every iteration, I'm, I'm, I'm converging on where I think I am. Okay? So, so this idea of, of looping back and forth between the measurement and the time is completely there in the particle filter. The problem is that in, in, is this integral is too complicated to compute in a closed form. So what you do instead is, is you basically maintain samples, and then all the tricks of the particle filter math come in to make sure that your samples are accurately representing this distribution. So each particle was a particular hypothesis about where I think I, think I am right now. And, and, and what that lets it do is, is maintain this distribution even when I can't analytically compute this integral. Um, we also, in class, briefly talked about uh, Kalman filters, extended Kalman filters. So if I make assumptions that this distribution is Gaussian, um, Gaussian is kind of, they're, they're, they're like viruses, they spread. <laughs> like, um, the conjugate prior for Gaussian is another Gaussian, right? So, so, so it makes this whole thing become analytically computable, again. And I get a bunch of matrix operations, basically. That's what a Kalman filter is. And the math of it, like if you write it out, all the math, it looks really scary. Like it's got all these like matrix dot products and Hessians and, and stuff like that. Um, but it's essentially doing this integral and, and things cancel because you're Gaussian only when things cancel and you're doing things um, in, uh, it, it's sort of like RMAX, like you've got all these model parameters you've got to keep track of. The bookkeeping becomes complicated and so the actual, Actually understanding it enough to implement it is complicated, which is why we chose not to implement to, to have you guys do it. But, but that's sort of the, the difference between that versus a particle filter. Like you can do it analytically. You get a, a closed form representation. It means that, it, that you might be making assumptions that aren't true because it might not really be Gaussian. Um, whereas a particle filter doesn't have that requirement. But you get this nice closed form and you can do things with fast matrix operations. Does that, does that help? All right, so this was like the math of the prediction step where we were taking, using our Bayes rule to get this all out, and I have the integral right there. And then the measurement update where we did it with Bayes rule, and then we made a bunch of assumptions. So this is just Bayes rule straight out, and then we knocked off some things here. We, we said we don't need the history of previous measurements. We don't need the history of control. Numbers. All we need to know is our current state. We can assume these independence assumptions. And then, um, and then uh, we basically write this normalization over z as as nu, or whatever that I actually forgot the name of this random number of this Greek letter. What? Eta. Yes. Okay. Eta. Thank you. And and then writing it with bal and bal bar. So these kinds of manipulations you should be comfortable with. Um, you should un you might you, these slides are up online too. So um, yes. Are you saying that we would need to be able to come up with our own independence assumptions, or using independence assumptions that were given? Yes. Yeah, so, so, so um, you should be comfortable not c necessarily coming up with your own independence assumptions, but reading a problem description and then translating that to algebraic manipulations like these, which you can then justify with Bayes rule conditional independence assumptions. So, like the way. That I, we're, gonna, we're not going to actually be able to have you write down a derivation like this, but we have some, we're, th we're going to have some questions where we're asking for, for these types of manipulations in, in uh, not localization problems, but other types of problems. And you should be comfortable with, with this math, um, sort, of, sort of knowing what it looks like. Okay. We are coming up on 10 minutes, 15 minutes of. So, so I'm going to go for like you know, two to five more minutes, depending on how many more questions there are. And then we'll hand out the survey. Yes? Are we, are we practice problems like there were for the, uh, We're not going to release practice problems. So I, I feel with the midterm and, and the homeworks you guys have, and the textbook, you guys have uh, enough. Yes? Are we supposed to be able to access the midterm on? I think we've made it available. Is that, yeah. is that true? Um, yeah, there was a question. There was a little bit of an issue with the permissions. It looked like it was going to take minutes. It should be now. Yeah. 
What's that? Yeah. It's the first inning at the homework, and the midterm are going to be a lot easier than the finals. Uh huh. Are we going to, like, is the only way to actually study for it to do problems from the book? I, th uh, <laughs> I, th it, it's, it's, it, it, it's going to be easier, but it's going to be related. So if you're comfortable with the homeworks, my hope is that you're going to do well on the final. And if that's not the case, the curve will, will save you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? That's the same idea where we don't see whether we got it right. What's that? Yeah, you will not be able to see whether you got it right. So the, the grading policy is going to be the same as the midterm. Yeah? So just to clarify, it is during class on Thursday? It's, th it's Thursday and the following Tuesday. Two parts. Thursday and the following Thursday or Tuesday? Tuesday. What? Sun, Sun, Lab. Sun Lab, yeah. Yeah, I think I sent out an email. With yeah, Pat sent an email with all the information. The yes. No. Same rules as midterm, so none of that stuff. <laughs> We're going to have you maximize the thing and, and, and maximize the exam window. And, and there's going to be partial credit, as there was on the, the midterm. So you can show your work and, and see how that looks. All right, can I have a volunteer to collect the reviews? And I think you I think you just put it in the mail. I don't actually know. Yeah, I think you just put it inter put it in this envelope, and then it goes in interdepartmental mail. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.